How often do you go to the movie theater? Uh, we've been going pretty regularly uh, this summer. How often do you go and not see a children's movie? Never. <laughs> <laughs> I could do that whenever I want. I don't have kids. <laughs> and I, ne I, I just never go to the... I saw, I saw a couple of things at the film festival this year. Mm. I just never go to the theater. Asteroid City. I think it's come and gone. And I missed it. I could have just went out and seen it. Thinking about going out to the movies is just tiring. It is. And that's terrible. Yeah, I used to go all the time. They're coming to streaming a lot faster. Yeah, that's that's definitely a, a big factor. Like The Flash. I don't know when exactly, but I think it's coming pretty quickly, so well, there's no point spending money. Makes sense that <laughs> The Flash would be quickly coming and, well, and streaming. Yeah, you know, right past you. Probably. <laughs> I think I saw it. I don't know. <laughs> I've never fallen asleep in a movie theater. No. Neither have I. No, neither. Well, I, I did see Avatar 2 and I took a mental nap. But it, was, <laughs> really? it was not a literal nap. <laughs> Welcome to the basement, Bill Bolts. It's good to be here. Do you know what and do you know what an envelope is? <laughs> I've heard of them. Do you know what movie is in this envelope? I do not. Would you like me to show you? I would very much like you to show you. I will do just that, and then we'll go to the old leather couch and watch it, and then we'll discuss it. Sounds like a plan. This is the second half of Sci-Fi July. Last time we watched the Meg giant shark movie. Not much of a sci-fi movie, even though that is its official designation. Mm. But this movie is pure sci-fi because we are going into the future. We're going into space. Ooh. Aboard the Saturn III. Oh, fantastic. Released in 1980, Saturn III was produced and directed by Stanley Donen and stars Farrah Fawcett, Kirk Douglas, and Harvey Keitel, but not his voice. Stanley Donen replaced the original director, John Barry, in mid-production after Barry, a production designer of some renown, Clockwork Orange, Star Wars, Superman, etc., sure. proved to know absolutely nothing about directing a film. Donen and actor Harvey Keitel's relationship was so contentious that Keitel refused to participate in post-production dialogue looping. So all of his lines were overdubbed by British actor Roy Dotris. Mozart's dad in Amadeus. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Pretty sure. Hmm. Directly after filming wrapped on Saturn 3, Farrah Fawcett announced her separation from then-husband Lee Majors. <laughs> it's a bad time all around. <laughs> <laughs> Saturn. That grand old orb has been spinning around the sun for billions of years. Spinning and spinning and spinning. Just like this gift. Oh. <laughs> A sensory toy. <laughs> Roller rings. Magnet power. Show but it to the camera. Very, very science fiction. There you Magnets, go. Magnets, how do they work? That's stress relief, Bill. Oh. If that's something you could use in your life. Yes. And check it out. There's cool info on the back. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I didn't even notice. <laughs> yeah, it's like Fonzie-type info. <laughs> well, put on your helmet and strap in tight, because we're about to blast into space and rendezvous with Saturn III. Ooh. It's an entirely appropriate reaction. <laughs> Lord Grade, your movie, <laughs> sir. <laughs> Farrah Fawcett and both nipples. <laughs> Kirk Douglas, jaw fully clenched. Can't read the title. Your font is too... interesting. <laughs> Lord Vader has arrived at Saturn. <laughs> yeah, no Saturn 3 begins in space. One, two, three, four, nine, three. Beep, beep, boop, boop. Repeat. Beep, beep, boop, boop. <laughs> I'm so glad there's going to be an opening production number. <laughs> A real <laughs> splashy song and dance. Saturn 1 was fine. <laughs> Saturn 2 was nicer. But Saturn 3 is for me. <laughs> Everyone's looking for Captain James because he's late for his ship trip through space. Captain James, your presence on pad 73. Come and open them up. Your presents are here. Merry Christmas. <laughs> so he's, uh... <laughs> Captain James, your presence required urgent. We will take them back to the store. Other captains would be glad to have them. <laughs> they keep calling him. Captain James, your presence has been soonest. Captain James, your presents are all socks. We're sorry. <laughs> so there's a dude that also on the space station. His name is Benson. That you, Benson? So you blew the mental test, huh? Potentially unstable. <laughs> Benson proves this by opening the airlock and hurling Captain James through it. Whoa! He then takes a thing out of a thing. Two, four, nine, three. Hey, Benson, what's up? 
assumes the identity of Captain James, gets on the spacecraft, and takes off. He is bound for Saturn III. He flies through space, takes a trip through the rings of Saturn, and docks with the outpost. Any urgent unloads? It can wait. Let's get inside, then. I had an urgent unload the other day, if you know what I mean. Uh, I barely made it. <laughs> Here's where we've been for the last three years. <laughs> there he meets the commander of the facility, Adam. Captain. Major. And his feminine companion, Alex. They are also romantically involved. You get the bulletins, don't you? You're supposed to scan and acknowledge. We do acknowledge. But we don't always scan. Well, sometimes we scan, but don't acknowledge. <laughs> sometimes we scan twice. <laughs> Captain James, as he is known, is a bit standoffish and weird. No touch and contact. You mean don't touch? Correct. Would you prefer me to say no touchy? <laughs> They're currently in the middle of an eclipse. No external contact while we're shadow locked. It's a total eclipse of the us. <laughs> He's also brought with him some of these drugs called Blue Dreamers, which apparently are all the rage on Earth. You guys don't know about them, because you're way out here in the sticks. Here, in case you choose to try one. I think I'm falling for him. He's so surly. <laughs> what do you think of him? The captain? I don't know. He's funny. He sounds British, but he looks like he shouldn't be. They also have a dog, Sally. Oh, there's a crazy guy on board. That dog is going to meet its end in a very no. unpleasant way. That's right. No taxion contact. Double no touchies. Haven't you ever had a dog? A few times. Well, didn't they have names? Just something to eat. Give her to me. What? Don't. But I was looking forward to filet of Sally. <laughs> yes. Benson is noticing Alex. You have a great body. May I use it? I'm Bill, I've kind of been meaning to ask you the same question. Only. <laughs> it's something to eat. Yeah. <laughs> Benson doesn't understand. On Earth, everybody uses all the bodies. So get with it, baby. Enjoy your blues. <laughs> I certainly am enjoying these blues. <laughs> You know that Kirk Douglas came to the director at some point during production and said, you know, I can jump rope. <laughs> Benson has brought with him his own robot, which he is going to assemble. We finally find out what's in that tank. It's human brain tissue. Oh, you can see the CD collection in the background there. The Major is reaching something called an abort date. I think this is like a Logan's Run thing, where he gets to a certain age and they just end his life because he's no longer useful. He's obsolete. Alex and Adam each take half of the Blue Dreamer. Not much happens. I don't feel anything. <laughs> I, the moviegoer, also do not feel anything. I think you ought to go to Earth. What? You ought to go straight to Earth. <laughs> he builds the robot, he pumps it full of goo. Happy birthday! <laughs> I wanted you to meet Hector. Wheel and meditate. Wheel and meditate. Pedit wow. You know, when I, I went out for a peditate the other day, <laughs> it was nice to be out in the fresh air peditating. I don't hold with this peditation. <laughs> Begin. Five, six, seven, eight. dance number it leaves a little to be desired. <laughs> the happy couple are enjoying a game of chess. Do these two ever do work? <laughs> I know. Every time we see them, they're doing some sort of recreation. And the captain and Hector come by and say, well, can Hector play? Hector's real smart. What does the horsey do again? <laughs> I can interface with Hector through this thing in the back of my head. He's got a plug. I stick a pen in there and Hector knows my thoughts. Benson is insane, and so now the robot is probably going to be insane as well. And he can't play chess worth a damn. Because, as Adam explains, he doesn't understand sacrifice. That's one thing you can't teach them, Captain. Check me. Would you say I was a man who could control his thoughts? I think so. Now take that off very slow. No, no, go on. Now I'm going to think about nothing 
but hydroponics. Hydroponics. Yeah, hydroponics. Hydroponics. <laughs> hydroponics. <laughs> Well, the hydroponics in my pants are fully engaged. <laughs> Alex goes into the lab where the captain and Hector are working. She gets something in her eye. Oh, we need to get that out. He grabs her face, holds her eye open. The robot gets the thing out of her eye. That's better. <laughs> Here they are, lounging around again. You've been listening to our cuckoo. He's not so cuckoo. We have no Cocoa Puffs on board, so it's impossible for him to be cuckoo. This. Oh, thank you! <laughs> Benson and Hector have a heart-to-heart. -heart. Benson knows that Hector is attracted to the woman. And Hector knows that Benson is a murderer. Uh. Ah! Sally! Mm. Sally! <laughs> I'm running! Hector kills the dog. Farrah Fawcett has to act a little bit. <laughs> it's not... <laughs> Hector tries to kill Alex. Or something. Hector, please put me down. Hector just executed an incredibly violent meat cute between these two. <laughs> Hector goes on a rampage and he tries to kill Benson. But they trap the robot. Robots be tripping, right? <laughs> and as the robot goes to recharge, they zap him with a power surge and knock him out. You gotta dismantle this thing, crate it up, and then you're both gone. You flunked. You flunkhead. <laughs> but it seems that maybe Hector has gotten into the network of the space station, and he uses the robots that are there to rebuild himself. Benson takes a handful of pills, he barges into the boudoir. He's making his move. I'm leaving, and I'm taking your partner with me. That woman is going to be on my jock from now on. Benson and Adam fight. <laughs> Don't fight with him. He's got pill strength. <laughs> Out of nowhere, there's Hector. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Man got snipped. We need to get away from this robot. We need to escape from this station. Adam and Alex sneak around. Running around, slowly. Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> the suspense is killing me. <laughs> Adam! 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 Shh! What? <laughs> Adam devises a trap. It's icy water. They think they're going to freeze him, but it doesn't work. It's hopeless. That acting class I took, hopeless. <laughs> Have you guys seen my hand? <laughs> Where is the robot? Hector is with me. Hector is imitating his voice. Yeah, yeah he's yep, dead. Yep, yep. Yeah. They go to where the voice tells them to go. I'm alive. I haven't died. <gasps> Whoa! Yo! <laughs> I'm still alive. It's okay. <laughs> Ooh, that robot's a freak! We see Adam wake up. He's fine. He's totally alive. And he's got one of those implants on the back of his head. <laughs> You've got a coaxial input. <laughs> They've come out of that eclipse, and there's a patrol that has come by Saturn to check on them. Survey 19, come in, Saturn 3. Saturn 3 here, Saturn 3. This is the Major. Hector knows all their voices. Hello, Survey 19. No! Hello, Alex. Well, that's all, then. Talk to you in six months. Adam straps some things to himself. I'm you. I'm Adam. I'm, I'm the other one. one. I'm, I'm everyone. everyone. Except I'm Harvey Keitel. Adam understands sacrifice. No. No. This is... This is Sparta! <laughs> and they both blow up. Adam and Hector are no more. But we find out Alex is okay. Hello there. This is your captain speaking. And she's finally going to Earth. And that is the story of what happened on Saturn 3. Well, Bill, I got some bad news for you. We're going to keep right on going and watch Saturn 4. <laughs> Saturn 3. En español, Saturn 3. Sí. I think it's a movie about aging. 
That seems to be the main theme of it. The main character is concerned about reaching the end of his life, concerned yeah. about his usefulness. He's challenged by this young interloper. He's challenged by his relationship with this beautiful young woman. And perhaps that plays into the, you know, humans being supplanted by robots. Are, is, are we creating our own obsolescence? Robots are the ultimate in youth. Yes, yeah. they never get older. They never, you know. Yeah. You toss them in an icy bucket, and even <laughs> yeah. that doesn't stop. Yeah. They can still come at you really slowly. I think, in general, this movie's got a lot of good ideas and interesting ideas to think about, but its execution is not that good. Yeah. And it seems like a short story artificially uh, pumped up to novel length. And there's a lot of filler in that regard. The action is filler. Yeah. Okay, we need them to do something. But then they just run around. They just run and run and yeah. run. Yeah, there's no sense of geography. You, know, you never know where anything is. I think this happened in a lot of old sci-fi movies where the set is so modular. We have this hallway section. We're going to use yeah. it to be four different hallways. Yeah. And so they don't really have a sense of the floor plan. And also this was long before the idea of the audience is going to want to know what this space station looks like inside and out. We made fun of Hector's head a lot. His tiny little head on his giant body. But I thought his face was genuinely creepy. And even the size of his head kind of worked. The design of that robot is unique. You look at Maximilian in The Black Hole, and he's this badass robot. He's got spinning blade arms and, and yeah. everything. And this one, he moves herky-jerky. He's got a weird yeah. head. He's more of a Frankenstein monster. And that adds to the creepiness of the whole thing. Yeah. This is my big confusion about the movie. And it plays into Harvey Keitel's voice being dubbed over by another actor. When Alex is approaching Earth and they're on that space station it seemed to me that was benson's same voice really yeah i'd suggest you walk to the ports and get a good position for a swell view of mother earth i thought it sounded familiar i it didn't strike me that it was actually benson i wonder if because <laughs> uh, roy dotris doing all of harvey Keitel's dialogue it almost seems like they'd hired him to do the voice of the space station at the end so he was nearby <laughs> that happens to me all the time when i do when i do voiceover sessions they're always like okay you've done all the darth vader we got this other voice do you want to just do that while you're here <laughs> okay sure i expected that we were going to go to earth and see something well, she lands different. on earth and it's full of hectares yeah, yeah something like that alex farrah fawcett hmm she, did she do a lot of movies? I know she, she did Charlie's Angels. She did that um, rape revenge movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. From what I've seen of that, she's very effective. Not at all like we see in this movie. In just, her defense, she has said about Saturn 3 that she came into it thinking that her character was completely different. And by the time she got there, everything had been rewritten. The way she played the role, I was wondering, are we going to find out she's a robot? This was a couple years after Alien where there was a human masquerading as a synthetic human. And yeah. So you would think that that's in the zeitgeist of 1980. Yeah. That someone else would use that. I thought it was a little ridiculous and kind of funny. When Captain James is in the locker room and Benson comes in, he's like, Hey, Benson, heard you failed your crazy test. <laughs> yeah, I guess yeah. you're crazy, huh? Potentially unstable. <laughs> All right. You know, there were a lot of things that, lines and things that seemed like, oh, that's going to be important. But then it doesn't really play out like the, the Blue Dreamers. Yeah, that really has nothing to do with the story <laughs> And the, the handful of pills that Benson takes before things really hit the fan. What'd that do for him? I wonder if there was supposed to be a Blue Dreamer's dream sequence that they just ran out of money for. <laughs> Could be. <yeah. laughs> I think that's probably what happened. Well, Saturn 3 has closed up its airlocks, and now it's time for us to spacewalk on over to a little thing we call Seen It. Seen It. Mason Channels writes, Jackass forever. Frankly, it was some of the most fun I'd had in a theater. There's a real communal feeling when you're all laughing at the same dumb but very funny jokes. Seen it. Seen it. I will admit I love Jackass. I do too. <laughs> but I watched Jackass forever and I thought, I think this has run its course. Yeah. I'm concerned about those guys. Jo Johnny Knoxville basically gave himself brain damage yeah. during the that shoot. Yeah. You can hang up your boots, buddy. Yeah. You know, you're you're too old for this. Seeing like new people coming in to do it. 
It seems like the age of jackass is past. <laughs> yeah. It's not for the generations. Right. Because the new people don't have the charisma. They don't have the personality yes. of those old guys. That's exactly it. It's the charisma that they, they lacked. Knoxville gets run over by a bull. He's done that already. Yeah. Steve-O gets thrown up in the air in a porta potty. They've done that already. Yeah. Delivering physical trauma to... Y- yeah. There's only penis. so much nut torture <laughs> you can stand. Yeah. But there is a jackass 4.5. That has all their unused bits. And will I watch it? Yes, I will. Yeah. Luke Maudsley writes, uh, Easily my favorite that I watched last year was Dolores Claiborne, packed with outstanding performances and filmed beautifully. Seen it. Seen it. Did you read the book? Yes. Me too. It's one of Stephen King's worst books. Hmm. Dolores Claiborne is a novel-length monologue about this woman who killed her abusive husband. Yeah. And then... 20 or so years later, she's finally confessing it. It seemed like it was a writer saying, huh, I've never done this before. Let's see how that happens. Okay, yeah, I did it. And since I'm Stephen King, it's going to get published. <laughs> yeah. Dolores Claiborne in the movie is a big improvement on the novel. Dolores tells her story to her daughter rather than to the police, which is a more dramatic and a better emotional choice because mm. it makes it more personal. Sure. Stephen King's plots it's so fussy and so complicated and they're just step by step by step by step he's got to think himself out of the corner that he thought himself into Mm. and the movie just cleans up a lot of that it makes the story a lot simpler Kato Luhan Camacho seen it Mad God by Phil Tippett seen it seen it Mad God is a hard movie to talk about because there are no adjectives to describe Mad God. <laughs> they don't exist. No, language is <laughs> is thwarted. <laughs> Except for maybe the word splat. <laughs> Mad God makes an important distinction, and this is something we don't often think about, between story and narrative. This movie has no story, but there's a clear narrative. There's something going on, and I can follow it. Yeah. At a certain point, it got a little muddled, but for the most part, I could follow it. And then I, I watched the interview with Phil Tippett, and he was like, I was focusing more on narrative than on story. I was like, yes! <laughs> Movies like that, you really want to know what you're getting into. Most, most of the time when I watch a movie, I don't want to know anything about it. I don't want to see a trailer. I don't even want to know what the plot is. If you tell me it's a good movie, don't tell me anything about it. Mm-hmm. But there are some movies where you do want to know what it is. So you're not going into that expecting a story or expecting dialogue. Yeah. That and, much would have been. So I think I enjoyed it more because I knew what was coming. Mm. Creating those hairy little homunculus dudes who just get smushed at every turn. <laughs> yeah, you know? they do. My favorite one was that you see one of them walking and then... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This movie is very dark. It's very gross and very violent. I really <laughs> wish that I could meet Phil Tippett because I would ask him, were there things that you came up with for Mad God and then thought nah that's too far <laughs> I can't go there oh man <laughs> that thing with all the teeth uh, which one <laughs> yeah Ripley Lunar writes seen it Ghostbusters Afterlife it is fresh take on the franchise seen it seen it Ghostbusters Afterlife is a fascinating movie it's the best movie they could have made but it's deeply flawed And in a lot of ways, it doesn't work. Yeah. It's got your buddy in it. Carrie Coo. You worked with her. Yeah. Trod the boards. Yeah. (laughs) One time, uh, (laughs) in the continuance of a conversation I was not a part of, she grabbed my shirt and said, will you marry me? (laughs) Sure. (laughs) It seems to want to be a comedy, but it's got such a thread of melancholy and loss that runs through it. Yeah. At some point, it becomes a comedy, but it doesn't feel right. Yeah. And then the Ghostbusters show up at the end, spoiler alert. (laughs) You're very happy to see them. This is what you've been waiting for. Right. But they feel like they're in the wrong movie. I think the only one that feels like he should have been a part of what they were doing was Dan Aykroyd. Him doing the podcast or whatever he does and knowing the kids' podcast and that kind of thing. That was a fun thing. Yeah. That made sense. Mm -hmm. I loved when uh, Harold Ramis showed up. And I'm not in favor of putting dead people... In movies, without yeah. their knowledge and permission. But I love seeing them. I, I thought the movie had a good heart. Yeah. There is a place that you can go that's not located anywhere near Saturn, and that's our website, welcome to the basement show.com. Our entire catalog is there, and there are also PayPal donation buttons that you can click on and make a one time or rolling monthly donation to support this show. Your support is greatly appreciated, and it helps us 
Keep the lights on. <laughs> One of our generous donors is Michaela, who says, The best friend of my teenage years turned me on to your show, and five plus years later, still watching every one. I love what you do and how you do it. Thank you, Michaela. Oh, good one. Yeah. Assertive. <laughs> if you want to watch more chat between Bill and I and watch us open an enormous box, which is right over there, you can watch Unboxing, which comes out this coming Friday. Check it out. And now, check out this. Bernstein is really phoning it in here. <laughs> this is pretty much just 2001. No music until this, the, you can see the Saturn thing, and then it's just going to be do, do, do for the rest of it. You flunked.